what are known as SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that's used typically to treat things like anxiety and depression. And the early research on those SSRIs showed that they did not do anything for anxiety or depression. And they actually can cause massive harm to people because of the side effects. Hello and welcome to the Vinny Brusco Show podcast, episode number 457. This week's episode, I'm joined by Mikey Brackett. Mikey is a mentor, a therapist, a coach, and just recently released his program called Healing the Father Wound, where Mikey helps his clients dive deep within themselves and find the male energy that may be holding them back from showing up as the best version of themselves. Mikey and I dove into a whole heap of conversation, including why vampires can't see themselves in the mirror, uh, the history of psychology and philosophy, how the father wound may show up in your everyday life, what the father wound is, and how he can guide you to being the best version of yourself. Mikey and I have been having conversations like this for the last four or five months, so it's always great to bring those conversations to the podcast. Him and I speak on the same level, at the same frequency, and it's always a pleasure to have a conversation with Mikey. So I hope you enjoy episode number 457 with Mikey Brackett. Hi, this is Mikey Brackett, and you're listening to The Vinnie Brusco Show. And here we go. So you and I have been having these these hour-long powwow conversations every Thursday night on my commute home from work, and they have been very insightful. Yeah. You are a, a, a licensed therapist, you're a coach, you work with a lot of men and women, but mainly men. And I think you have this really keen ability to manage the practical, mm-hmm. but also incorporate what I love a lot about human existence, which is the woo-woo. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of a lot of therapists again, and maybe this is a very broad brush to stroke it with, but I feel like they are apprehensive to lean into the woo-woo of things. Oh, sure. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, why particularly do do therapists stay away from that? Well, I, th- I think it has a lot to do with um, the whole managed care Western medicine system. Um, with the foundation of modern psychology, you know, starting back with people like Freud, um, things became, there became like a push for things to be more provable, more definable, more workable, more treatable. And as that monster has evolved, there's become a lot of, um, at least from what I've seen, a lot of demand out of human anxiety for things to be fixed or changed in a, you know, predictable timeline with predictable outcomes. Um, And something about that uh, drivenness and something about the need for things to be understood, improved and um, worked with in a certain manner has really choked the life out of the soul of psychology and therefore um the understanding of like the soul of of people uh and in thus like the woo woo type stuff um i mean the foundations of psychology go back to you know the earliest people we know of you know people have always been trying to understand themselves and understanding life and understanding death and all the weird crazy interesting things that can happen um and as things have progressed, our discomfort with all of those things has led to these dynamics, like I mentioned in modern psychology, where we want to prove things and therapists are trained now in these models of you need to do things that are predictable, you need to do things that are provable, you need to do things that are research based, you need to prove you need to do things that have dot 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 attached to them in order for things to like be valid um and that's gotten really messy um and i think it's really hindered and hurt 
a lot of people's potential to truly heal. And then for therapists like myself to even feel like they can do the good work of being with people and wrestling with life and soulfulness um, in a free manner. Yeah. The idea that you would have to handcuff therapists or coaches for, you know, for to some degree, but really therapists or psychologists, you'd have to handcuff them and have them kind of stay on the, the, the outer skirts of the woo woo knowing that these are questions that have dawned. I mean, you go back to Stoic philosophy and that's, that's the premise of it, right? The, the contemplation of your own life and death and everything that's in between those two and to handcuff and to not allow that part of the psyche, which I think would be now is being more and more proven that it's a major part of the psyche and a major part of the healing process, but to handcuff therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists to only stay on a path that is like at your point researchable and provable and almost tangible really hinders the healing process right yeah it completely hinders it and the thing that i think a lot of people are starting to now realize is that not only does it hinder it but it actually does a lot of harm because you start trying to force certain things to work and produce different outcomes that may not do that because it that may not be the realm in which these real issues exist. Um, and what I'm one thing I'm referring to or thinking of as I say that is just like uh, what are known as SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. That's a classification of a psychopharmaceutical drug um, that's used typically to treat things like anxiety and depression. And the early research on those SSRIs showed that they did not do anything for anxiety or depression. But in the past 20 plus years, they have become the go-to medication that any general practitioner or psychologist or whoever else, or psychiatrist throws at a person to help them with anxiety and depression. And then just recently, I believe a few months ago, a lot of that older research was finally um, released to the public that showed that these things do not do what we say they do. Um, and they actually can cause massive harm to people uh, because of the side effects and because of how they do alter and affect uh, neurology and neurochemistry and physical dynamics. So when you say they're not doing anything, what, are you saying that they're not getting to the root of the anxiety or the depression? Are they just kind of putting on a Band-Aid on the deeper issue and suppressing the actual, you know, the chemical reactions that are transpiring in the mind and the brain on a, on a tangible level? Yeah, I would say it's all of it. Like some of the research articles that you, I believe you can find now show that the um, the measured outcomes didn't change or affect certain mood issues in any given positive direction because they weren't actually affecting significant levels of serotonin change. Mm. Um, and then on the other side, like your question said, so not only are these chemicals not doing what they say they do from a very chemical level, they also don't, yeah, they don't treat the primary issues. Um, Gabor Mate just came out with a, a really good book that puts a lot of this stuff into words, things that I've talked about and believed and seen for years um, called the myth of normal. And he talks about it's not um, normal to be trying to function in a sick society that deems certain things like this, that, or the other as acceptable norms for people that should never be accepted as norms. And I think that's, you know, speaking to your point, um, things like anxiety and depression have so many different types of interpretations and variations on them. Um, and the root issue for most depressive and anxious type symptoms has nothing to do with serotonin or even um, certain levels of 
you know, happiness. It has a lot to do with like a level of the soul and how the human person's own interior being fluctuates in a normal way, just like the seasons fluctuate. But because we've deemed those things as bad or wrong or dysfunctional, and we also have created a culture and a society that doesn't hold space for things like ritual and grieving and sorrow and all these other things, when someone feels something bad, we immediately react to it and then get into a process of trying to quote unquote fix it. When we need to be asking deeper questions, we need to be changing society and we need to be re referring to these experiences of being human in a different way in our own selves. Yeah. And that's, and that's a huge part of the healing process is reverse engineering the person reverse engineering what is coming up in their life? What is this trigger? And I'm not a big fan of the word trigger, but it's, it's, let's just use it for argument's sake and reverse engineering it to getting to the root cause of these things. And, you know, living in a culture that doesn't allow people to heal in this way or frowns upon this way of healing certainly puts us as a culture in a position where we're, we're exacerbating the, the the illness and exacerbating the anxiety exacerbating the 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 depression and by not allowing people to heal heal the way that is true to them and ignoring the soul and ignoring that you know that connective tissue that we all seem to have that's underlying between all of us it does prevent the healing process now and this is kind of what our conversations have been recently over the phone is is multifaceted and you can go down so many different rabbit holes and one avenue that you've been going down and is a huge part of your therapeutic practice and coaching is what you call healing the father wound yeah. so define what is what is the father wound yeah so the the like basics of it are that we as individuals coming into this world you know, because how that works, we have a father and a mother. We have a depends on who you ask these days. Right. Yeah. That's that's yeah. But somehow something happens, right? <laughs> right. Uh, and one of those uh one of those pieces is a dad or a father or a, a male sperm donor or something. Right. Um and that person embodies or is supposed to embody an essence of masculinity and represent, you know, to us, especially, you know, when we look at the chromosomal stuff, X, Y, all that stuff, like that part of it. Um, so the basics of it are, you know, if, you, if you've come into this world, you have a dad, that dad may be good, bad, ugly, indifferent, whatever. Um, and because of that dynamic between you and that person, and what they represent, there are wounds that you incur um, as you seek to develop and grow into who you're going to be. Sometimes those wounds are very active and abusive and overt and clear. Uh, the, the harm that's done is very clear and definable. Other times they're covert, um, meaning that they're not really noticeable. They might be deemed as normal. They, may, they might be sort of passive. Uh, meaning that like maybe it wasn't intentional, but it kind of happened, which I think is probably most people is that there's some sort of passive wounding that takes place. Um, and then there's kind of the general category that um, there's some mixture of the two. Um, so a father wound is basically a psychological wound that you incur as a result of being in relationship with a man, a father in your life that does not fully support and honor your identity as an individual person coming into this world uh, with your own, what Michael Mead refers to as like your own genius or your soul or your own spark. First, I guess the first question would be females could obviously experience the father when this is not just a male oriented uh healing process yeah it's definitely not male specific again if you're a person coming into this world you have a father on some level 
whether absent or active or engaged or whatever you have that. So it's men and women alike uh, and everything else in between, you know, we as people um, have this. And you mentioned that a part of it is the essence of a father and the essence of a male. Mm -hmm. What, what would you define as the essence of that? What is that male essence that you, you refer to? Sure. So if we talk about this in, let's say, the Jungian terms, so the school of psychology from Carl Jung, there's the um, the structure, per se, of the self, the person. And in that structure, you have a persona, an ego, and a shadow. And then within that, you that it accumulates like the constellation of the self. Below that, you have what's called the anima and the animus, or which can be another way to refer to the masculine and the feminine. And so each person has a masculine energy and a feminine energy within themselves. And because of how we're wired and because of how this world works with uh, dichotomies and polarities, you know, positives, negatives, neutrons, electrons, protons, that kind of thing, there's a natural interplay between opposites. And so in this case, every person contains a masculine essence, and that is overtly contained um, in the ways we conceive of ourselves through maleness or being a man um, or being a father and things like that. And so, yeah, the reference to the essence there is less about man or woman and more about masculine and feminine. And it's also archetypal in the sense that there are masculine archetypes and feminine archetypes. Uh, archetypes are just basically ways of making sense of the various uh, characological dynamics that we can um, portray and engage in our life. Is it possible for someone to enter the world without uh, a father wound or, or have that essence be tainted? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know for sure. My inclination is to say no, because I believe that the process of being human is a journey. And a part of that journey requires and follows a trajectory of learning and soul learning and, accessing really powerful dynamic things that might be more that woo woo type stuff. Um, and so there's something and Joseph Campbell did a really cool job of laying this out for us in what he called the hero's journey, but there's something within what it means to be human that, f that seems to be geared at, a sort of development and experience that regardless of age and era and resources happens and has happened in the whole course of human history since the earliest times we can know of it. And that's where, you know, Joseph Campbell's work around mythology, uh, history, um, and all of that in his conceptualization, conceptualization of the hero's journey is really, really cool. Um, and so with that being, true as far as i see it and believe then i don't know if it's possible to not incur a father wound or in that sense the opposite a mother wound um wounding seems to be a uh necessary requirement um in this life um it seems to be a dynamic that contain some sort of deep knowledge that we haven't fully tapped into yet. Um, and that's a part of why I focus on this father wound stuff is there's, there's something really profound in the wounding that because of how we're wired and because of what it means to be human, there's something really profound in that wounding that helps you if you'll alchemize it or initiate through it or, you know, other words to use would be just like heal it properly, you'll access something in yourself that you never could have done otherwise. Um, and so there's this, 
there's a whole dynamic in healing of the father wound that focuses on really coming to terms with the dynamics between you and your own personal father and the the shitstorm that that can create for people especially when we look at like some of the dynamics and statistics about mental health and wellness and patriarchy and suicidality and all these other things that are happening that seem to be just overt unnecessary suffering but then there's something really profound as you continue to engage this idea of a father wound that goes beyond the personal father into the archetypal father, uh, into the, you know, maybe spiritual father essence of sorts that starts to really get interesting and weird and profound and deeply exciting, I think. Um, but if you don't do the personal work of dealing with the wounding, the psychological wounds you have, especially your father wound in this life, what begins to happen is you really don't have access to those deeper soul realities um, that you could access because you continually operate from a foundation that um, is lacking some things that you need in order to fully go through uh, that hero's process into becoming a a full self, um, capital S self, as Jung described it. And the thing about Joseph Campbell is that he brought the idea of the hero's journey, obviously, and that that tale of the hero's journey is something that has transcended over time. And we see it, and you can see it in every single bit of literature, every single bit of film, your own personal life, if you were to take things to that depth level, like I said, oh, we're having the computer issues. Is that really, is that the universe or is that just bullshit? And right. you can you can, you can can have that turn of the stone and that perspective, and you could see it either way. I could see it as, oh, technology's not on my side today, or it's the universe conspiring against me, or it's just trying to see how badly I want to record this podcast today. So right. there, there's truth in all of those perspectives. It's just a matter of which perspective I want to focus on and what I want to put my energy into. And I think that's what Joseph Campbell did was that he was able to take the 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 quiz essential story of everyone of every the human experience and bring that down to this level of uh theater and and play and you know almost like bring in this element of of childlike wonder to it that touches us on a very soulful level yeah yeah, and I think I think it touches us on a deeply soulful level because it's a story that's written into our our DNA and our makeup and our psyche, and everyone knows it's true. And a part of the human journey is to access and advance and tap into your own story and what that means. And that's why you know, in so much of the work I do, whether it be father wound stuff or therapeutic stuff or mentoring stuff, it's like those stories are so powerful because they're calling to your soul and the stories that call to your soul are the ones that are trying to show you and lead you towards why you're here in the first place. Um, And there's a, you know, there's a lot of answers, right. Of like, to the question of why are we here or what it, what does it mean to be human? But you really see your unique individual dynamics when you begin to listen to your soul as it is finding connections within the myths, the stories, the, you know, the artistic expressions in the world around you. Um, and oftentimes things like the father wound. And again, I'll mention the mother wound because it's the, it's the opposite. Um, those things uh, happen in the place of your deepest strength and your soul's purpose like it's a wound because it hits you where it hurts it's a wound because it scratches onto something that really is vital to your existence and because of you know the craziness of what it means to be human it can be very easy to live life very disconnected from that and so that's a part of why you know on the other side of dealing with the personal father wound and getting into the greater the great father or the archetypal father or the deep masculine. Like that's why it's so important is it's like, Oh, if you can 
then see, um, and one of my mentors, Michael Mead says that like the wound is the doorway. Um, and so again, we, we do the work of healing the trauma of dealing with the daddy issues of confronting the unhealthy masculine dynamics that you were raised in that are not only personal, but also societal and cultural. And then we transcend that and get into the, the archetypal father so that you can begin to access the power of your soul here and now, and actually discover who you are and come to peace with what this life is, and then begin to live out of that place, knowing that you're here for a reason, not in some fluffy silver lining kind of way, but like there's a story written into your soul that you're here to actualize. Uh, and if you can do that, there's no telling what that could mean for the evolution and the existence of humanity throughout time. And in even potentially this universe. Yeah. And if you didn't want to get so grandiose with it, with I'm, I'm with you on that level, but if you want to even just take it to a very interpersonal relationship, it also helps you buck the system, so to speak for mm -hmm. your own children or for whomever your next of kin would be right. It gives you the opportunity to, maybe not heal it because it, it seems like it's something that is, you know, ancestral and maybe it's something that can never be healed to your earlier point, but it also gives you an opportunity to see it for what it potentially also can be rather than, Oh, well, my dad was just a dirt bag or, you know, mm -hmm. my dad wasn't that bad. He was great, you know, but there is still something there that is underlying that is, is to your earlier point, touching mm -hmm. you on a wound and it's, it's hitting you for a reason. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is hitting you in a, for a reason. And yeah, to to make it again, maybe more practical and personal and less esoteric, it's like, you know, we all want and hope for certain things in this life and your degree of fulfillment and happiness, you know, in this life will come from how active you are in engaging those things in your everyday experience and being able to actualize them and the reason why you long for that stuff is because like you're here um, and it's okay to just be here and want to make this life good. And you can do that, you know, by taking these things seriously. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that you have to like, and I, I have this conversation with clients all the time. They're like, well, like my dad wasn't that bad or, you know, my childhood wasn't that bad. And, Oftentimes when someone says that it actually was pretty bad, you know, it's just right. dulled out because it's too painful to look at. Um, but in the genuine cases, when people say that, and it is legitimately true, um, I, I just help them recognize that it doesn't matter how good or bad your dad was on some level. What matters is how you've internalized what you did or didn't get that has led and set the foundation for you to believe things about yourself, to believe things about the world and to believe things about others that aren't in your best interest and ultimately probably aren't true. Uh, and again, that can come from, you can have a really good dad uh, who just because of the fact that he's human and you're human extends a sort of wound to you that makes you doubt yourself or makes you doubt others, or makes you feel a little bit on edge about this, or leads you to be more biased in this direction or that direction. Um, and cultural influences as well can do that. Um, and so it's like, well, if you're going to take your life seriously as a person, you got to look at all your biases. You have to look at all the things that you don't want to look at. You have to look at um, what's actually possible and learn to listen um, and everything else in between. How do you find with your clients, how do you find those, those routes to those wounds? Is there something that you, you, you practice with them? Is there a certain practice that they engage in that allows them to first, I guess, get to the surface level and then, and then potentially journey to the subatomic level, the quantum level? Right. Yeah. The two things that come to mind that I think are 
primary access points that I engage with a lot of clients. And then in the program that I run on healing the father wound is, is core questions that are brought up there is what do you believe is not possible for you? Um, those assumptions about life are a clear indication of where and how your father wound is, has set the foundation for your assumptions about yourself in life. Um, and then in your quest of trying to understand who you are or develop a sense of identity, where do you feel like it gets really difficult and where do you feel like it gets really confusing? Um, whenever a, a client, whether it be coaching or mentoring or therapy or whatever the things I've done in the past are, it's like whenever someone's asking the question of who am I, they're asking the questions that come out of the father wound, which is a wound of identity. Uh, it's a wound to the core self that confuses and distracts away from that core, heartful, whole uh, self that can be uh, established and pursued in your own development and your own progress as a person. Um, so yeah, so if you're asking the questions of who am I and beginning to try and make sense of the areas of your life where you feel like that's been confusing and then asking the questions of like, what do you believe is possible for you or what do you believe is not possible for you? And whenever someone's being like, well, I can't do that, or I don't know about that, or, you know, I might could do that, or I might be able to, but that means this, this, and this, that shows you too some of the core places of where the father wound has uh, set a core um, kind of stake in the ground for you as a person. And it doesn't have to be this, again, to the earlier point, it doesn't have to be this constant massive amount of abuse. It can just be these onesie twosie events that's transpired within the relationship of that figure in your life mm -hmm. that has set you into some corner in the room, so to speak, of your mind that perhaps you just don't interface with or you choose not to deal with or you choose to leave in that corner of the room. I remember watching a, a gestalt therapy session and it was very much that of this, this you know, very brass nose approach to therapy but you know in in the pre in, in the series that was documented he attacks in the sense of like you know it was very you know very currently smoking a cigarette and you probably couldn't get away with it now in this in this world but really calling out the young lady on her bullshit and saying like is this how you feel like do you feel like a little girl all the time that you need to sit in a corner of a room and who's not giving you permission is it you or is it is it and mm -hmm. then she starts to unravel and he gets to the root of it. He gets to, well, you make me, you remind me of my father and he was always right. And he was this, and he was that. Right. And, right. and in that session, you could see the, the onion peel back of the experience. Mm -hmm. And it was such a powerful way to go about it. But at the same time, it doesn't need to be this abusive relationship of physical yeah. or sexual or, or mental abuse. It can just be events that transpired over the duration of your lifespan that yeah. made you feel less than right. Yeah. You know, one of the, one of the things that I think is really important to, to note about that is you can have a really good father who himself is carrying, you know, what we know is like transgenerational trauma in his own self and his own cells that is passed on to you, not because he's done anything wrong or he's been hurtful just because of the fact that things have been, uh, transmuted over time or um, have been passed down over time. Sure. Um, and those things have a very real epigenetic cellular effect. Um, have they done studies on that where they see an actual? Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a, there's a, um, oh shoot. I'm gonna forget his name now. Um, his name is Mark. What's Mark's last name? I forget Mark's last name, but he wrote a book called uh, "It Didn't Start with You," um, and it's about it's a very easy to understand, really clear book about um, transgenerational trauma. So he 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 brings it into the cellular cellular le, le, le level. <laughs> yeah, I mean he he introduces this idea um, in a really helpful way 
uh, because it's pretty, again, it's another one of those things when you, that initial question you asked about, like the woo woo being taken out of therapy and stuff like that. It's like, when you start asking questions of like, how is it that someone feels, thinks, and struggles with these things, even though they've never experienced this, 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 or this, and their parents never experienced this, 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 or this, and all these things would indicate that everything's okay, but this problem isn't resolving in someone's life. And it sends you back into like, well, what happened to their ancestors? What happened to their grandfather? What's the greater family story that's played out over time? Um, and one of the things that, you know, is, is really, um, really, I think profound about this is the history of humanity is not a pretty history, especially in the past. Well, I mean, uh, forever, really the amount of bloodshed and warfare and genocide and hatred that have been extended and repeated and continued by people, you know, there's no way that that could not have an effect on us here now. You might not have been a slave or uh, a part of a massacre or, you know, in World War II or, you know, put through the Inquisition, but your ancestors were, and your ancestors' cultures were, and those cultures interacted with different things. And there's something that we've learned about on the epigenetic, epigenetic level that you know, if we take the soul out of it for a second, there's cellular changes that happen to people that get passed on to their children. And those cellular dispositions are embedded in their DNA. And depending on what happens in their life, those things can activate or deactivate certain things that are helpful or hurtful. And then that can be passed down. Sure. And it, and it makes sense on the physical level too, right? Like, you know, if you're a stressed animal, your body's going to be in a certain state, right? And it's going to react and respond to things in a different way. And now yeah. if you were to take that and, and, you know, magnify that or, 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 you know, remove yourself from that and zoom out on that, it would make sense that those energetic feelings are going to have an effect on the person. And then they're going to have an effect on the relationship and then the child. And even if it's not outwardly abusive to the earlier point it's going to show up in some way shape or form it right. has to it has to it has an imprint on the 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 person itself so right. even if it's even if they do handle or interface with that experience and heal over it mm -hmm. it's still going to have an impact throughout time right yeah yeah. And then when you incorporate the the reality that we are people, or at least from what I believe, that people who have souls, it's like, well, what's this, the impact of the soul through these things? And it brings in a whole nother category of understanding that there's a lot more going on for us than we lead on. And if your parents, as they did and uh, uh, most likely um, have carried, there's that dynamic of they have the cellular dynamics that have played into what is possible, what they believe, how they feel, what's real for them. And they also have the soulful level of, you know, what things they carry, whether it be a burden or a light into the world from their own experience of being a part of a greater um, experience of life through your family line and your culture. How would someone know if the father wound is showing up in their in their life? Is it something on a day to day? Is it a moment to moment? Is it you know? Is there any key yeah. factors that come out? Yeah, I mean it's all of the above. Um, the the father wound again, as I mentioned, is a is a core psychological soul wound, um, and again, its counterpart is the mother wound. So you know if you're doing therapeutic work and you've never asked these questions or your therapist or coach has never asked these questions, it would be really important to incorporate that into your process. Cause what I've seen is that these masculine and feminine wounds are the, the foundation on which almost everything is built. And so when you look at your life and you're running into struggles and problems and stressors and things that just feel like they don't get better, most likely you're running into a wound problem uh, not just a, a life problem or a personal problem. Um, and so a lot of the times, you know, the ways that you see 
the father wound manifest in daily life. Um, and I'll just say this as a, another reference point, but the father wound can also be known uh, in the Jungian terms as a negative father complex. Um, and a complex is just an, another way of describing like a personal issue. Um, that's a very dumbed down way of describing that. But these things can show up in the, the primary ways I've seen it is in drivenness. Um, so need to do more, need to prove more, need to show more, uh, need to earn more. Uh, there's a constant like, I can't stop, I have to keep going kind of dynamic, an inability to rest, an inability to relax, an inability to have fun, or on the opposite side, a compulsive need to have fun, a compulsive need to avoid, a compulsive need for things to be light or easy. Um, and in the Jungian world, again, that's often what can be referred to as the puer. Uh, which is an archetypal world for the flying boy. Um, and my mentor, John Lee, wrote a few books called The Flying Boy that really describe this in easy, accessible ways. Um, and if you've never heard of him or read those books, it'd be really cool. But that's a that's like a compensation. So like, you know, the flying boy can be a very wounded man, but can appear outwardly as a very spontaneous, a very alluring, a very interesting, a very dynamic person. Typically they're very spiritual. Sometimes they're very emotional, uh, but underneath the surface, it's a very reactive process. And a lot of times the ways the father wound shows up in that sense, uh, if we're juxtaposing like one manifestation looks like the driven go-getter, businessy, success-oriented, achieving-oriented person who will sacrifice a lot of themselves for the external validation of money, finances, success, image, that kind of things. The juxtaposition of that is the, the flying boy, um, which is the hippie, the social justice oriented person, the adventurist, the thrill seeker, the creative type, um, but the reaction here is, you know, the driven person is reacting out of a wounded place that is trying to prove their identity in the world. And then the puer is acting from a reacted place, trying to disprove their identity in the world by subtly and unconsciously throwing up a middle finger to anything that represents masculinity or fatherliness or, you know, what we now talk about is like in regards to patriarchy. Um, but underneath that, again, to make this a little bit more like easy to understand, like commitment issues are huge. Feeling exhausted all the time is a huge indicator. Feeling like you have to do more in order to be okay. Uh, feeling like there's something, um, you have to fight all the time, um, in order for things to be okay. And these are subtle, you know, sometimes it's like, um, it maybe it's not overt fighting. Like we tend to fixate on with like unhealthy forms of masculinity. It can be, you know, very emotional and very subtle where, you know, you carry a posture into the world or into your relationships where you have a big wall up or you carry a big shield because it's like, no, I'm right. Or no, that's not okay. Um, and so anytime someone is seeing this play itself out where they feel on edge a lot. They're very untrusting of people and situations and circumstances and systems. Um, they feel like they have to put themselves in a situation where they're seen and acknowledged more than somebody else. Like those are all very subtle and at the same time, overt signs that the father wound is really running the show. Mm. So and it makes sense. It makes sense if you reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. and and you and you take either one of those stereotypical males to mm -hmm. their own degree, and right. you were to actually sit down and reverse engineer what's actually transpiring, it would lead to some type of compensation yep. uh, on some level, and it could be you know to the to the point of where you're overworking, or it can come to the point where, you know, you want to live in a van down by the river, right? And both 
both are being expressed in some way. But again, when you do the, and that's something that's been a big part of my own, you know, self-awareness would be that if something triggers me rather than just being reactive, I go, why is that bothering me? Like, right. What is it about that? That's really bothering me. And I, and I do my best to sit and uh, reverse engineer yeah. the the steps that have taken me there on this physical level, like what actually happened. Mm -hmm. And then I go on, I, I do my best to go on a deeper level and go, okay, well, where's that coming from? Because right. you could say, well, that guy's a dick and that's might be valid. Sure. But there's also something about that dick that's bothering you. So mm -hmm. you need to really look inwardly and, 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 that's a potential route to heal. Right. Yeah. It's a huge route to heal. And, you know, I, I see this equally in men and women and the questions that I often ask are, um, you know, what's under that, right? Like um, you're asking in your own self inquiry, like, okay, where's this coming from? Right. And I often will ask, you know, what's, what's below that because there's a need and a desire typically below even those things that we have a hard time acknowledging a desire to be seen, a desire to be acknowledged, a desire for someone to be curious in us, a desire to feel the relief and the the ease that comes with someone truly helping you and supporting you and being with you in a process. Um, and a lot of times those needs and desires, we internally, um, because we've internalized the critical father or we've internalized our father wounds will be really harsh with those things. You know, maybe a part of the dynamic like you're talking about for yourself is you don't let these things happen or you struggle with that or re you react to this person because underneath the surface you're, you're really feeling, you know, insubstantial in your own self. And right. because you don't feel substantial in yourself, you know, following the trail of whatever, there's a part of you that believes that someone treating you poorly is justified um, because underneath all of that is a wound that says, yeah, you're not, you're not worth being seen and acknowledged and held in a unique light and perspective that validates the fact that like you deserve to be treated well and you deserve to be seen uh, in a really profoundly beautiful way. Well, it's weird because it's, 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 it's both sides, right? There's the, you know, the culture of, you know, you're a unique snowflake. And then it's, you know, and then it's the other, like, no, you're not motherfucker, you right. know, and, and both of those are needed and valid. And there is this, this need to be seen, which I think is a huge part mm -hmm. of any person at any given time. And I know it from being a father yeah. is that people on the deepest, deepest level, they want to be accepted and loved and all that. Yes. Yeah. But on the truest, deepest level, people want to be seen, which I think is, is a, is, is a point of their soul. I think that's, that's what it is. Their soul wants to be seen right. and not necessarily accepted or loved or, or that's, right. that's kind of the next layer, but right. at the root of it, I think being seen is the most quiz essential foundation for human existence right and i would say that is a direct tie to the father wound because the masculine's role uh the father's role in the creation of their child is to see them to validate them and help them form a full identity um you know, I often talk about how the father wound is a wound to identity and the mother wound is a wound to worth. Um, and so if you struggle with worth and value, you might be in the realm of mother wound. If you're struggling with identity and purpose and things like that, you're in the realm of father wound. And it's it's in that role that the father's job is to see, to truly reflect and mirror back to his child the profound reality of who they are and then it's the mother's job to hold that child and so with the combination you know because i often say that the father wound and the mother wound are two sides of the same coin um when you have the combination of a person that is seen and held in this world then you get the felt experience as a person of being and feeling like you're okay and that it's okay for you to be you and that it's okay for you to be here now. And oftentimes a lot of people 
when they're struggling with, is it okay for me to be who I am? Is it okay for me to be here now? Can I take up space? Can I ask for what I need? All that kind of stuff. That's a, that's a direct pull out of this father wound that says, you know, oftentimes what happens internally for someone who has a father wound is because the father doesn't see the child, they don't validate and challenge them in an appropriate way. Someone will say, well, then I don't exist. Mm. It's like looking in a mirror and not seeing a reflection. Oh, that's fucked up. <laughs> You're like a yeah. vampire. Right. Well, exactly. Well, I mean, when we talk about mythology and stuff, it's like those mythologies and those stories of like vampirism. It's like if you really read them and if, say, you want to geek out on it, it's such a portrayal of. You froze. Oh, you froze. Thank you for watching episode number 457 with Mikey Brackett. Unfortunately, we came across some technical issues and some of the episode was lost, but we will be recording part two of this podcast in the coming weeks. So I look forward to bringing that to you. Every time Mikey and I connect, it's always a deep conversation, a meaningful conversation. And I hope you got a lot out of this conversation and the next one. So I look forward to sharing that conversation with you even further. Do me a favor, subscribe, rate, and review the podcast right down below means a lot to me, helps with the algorithm, helps with all the nonsense that I quite frankly don't understand, but it does mean a lot to me. So I appreciate that. And I will check you guys out next time. Until then, much love. Peace.